Here we go again. <laughs> a new year brings new opportunities. A fresh start to reset rhythms. What if you could enter a new zone of fresh focus and purpose? How would life be different? More fulfilling? Join us for an epic City First series. Find your flow and maximize the greatness God has placed within you. Welcome to City First Church. So glad that you're here. Happy New Year. I know we're a month in, but I haven't seen you. You haven't seen me in 2021. So I pray that your year, despite uh, what it's looked like for you thus far, is off to a good start. I want to take a moment to say hello to everyone in Cape, everyone in the State Line area, everyone at our God Behind Bars locations. Come on, can we make some noise for them? We love you guys. And of course, I want to say hello to everyone that is watching online. We've been in a series called Find Your Flow, and I know that the previous 365 days has been challenging for a lot of us, and uh, it can be difficult to get in a rhythm. Find your flow. I wonder how many people today are watching or listening, and you really hope that January 1 would be like this magical date, like everything would change. And we're still here. Almost feels like 2021 can sometimes be a continuation of 2020. And here's the deal. I don't know what's going to happen over the next 11 months in your life. I can't tell you what's going to happen in the economy. I can't tell you what's going to happen in your home. I can't tell you what's going to happen in your school. But this I do know. No matter what happens, you're going to need God. You're going to need God. This doesn't matter what's happening. It doesn't matter what happens in politics. It doesn't matter what happens with the economy. It doesn't matter if you're on Reddit and you're trying to figure out a GameStop deal. Hey, here's the deal. I know for a fact you are going to need God. And here's what, what, I, what I want you to know is that there is a life available to you today where you can truly discover a rhythm and truly find your flow. And it can go way beyond your circumstance and can lead to a year like you've never experienced before in your life. Today, I want to talk to you about something that I believe has a profound impact on the way that we live. It has a profound impact on our relationships, and it has a profound impact, ultimately, on how we all make decisions. My heart breaks. Like, like, uh, like what, what really keeps me up at night is when I sit with people who have found themselves in an unwanted destination in their life that came as a result of some poor decisions that they made. Here's the, here's the reality. Every single person under the sound of my voice has a rubric, has a system in which we live our lives and make decisions. And I found that we all live by one of three wills. The first will that we live by is, well, our will. This is where we choose to live our lives based off of what feels good to us in the moment. This is going with the gut. This is where most of us do whatever it is that we want to do. We eat whatever we want. We try to buy whatever we want, watch whatever we want. And what I've learned about our will and my will is we usually will choose comfort over discipline every single time. We're hitting that part of the year right where we're starting to give up on some of our New Year's resolutions. And the Super Bowl weekend is usually about the time the New Year's diet is broken. You can't resist the wings, the pizza, the Doritos. And, and we just, you know, our, our will is somewhat overrated. But then there's the second will that a lot of people live their lives by, which I like to call their will. God's got a plan for your life. So do other people. This is where a lot of us choose to measure our lives by the status quo. This is where our lives and decisions are primarily based off of, well, what's everyone else doing? What's everyone else in the neighborhood doing? What kind of car do they have? What kind of job did they get? What sports are their kids in? What are they posting? Where did they go on vacation? I can't tell you how many people I know who are living out their parents' will for their life. They went to the school their parents wanted them to go to. They're dating who their parents approve of. And everything has been guided by their parents. I can't tell you how many people I know that change their outfits, their hair, and what they wear based off of the will of their friends. Uh, one of my favorite authors is James Clear. He did some writing on this as of late in an article where he talked about what actually changes people's minds. He found that facts don't change our minds. Friendship does. Convincing someone to change their mind is really the process of convincing them to change 
their tribe. If they abandon their beliefs, they run the risk of losing social ties. And you can't expect someone to change their mind if you're going to take away their community too. So you have to give them somewhere to go, which is why we talk a lot about small groups. Nobody wants their worldview torn apart if loneliness is the outcome. And that's where a lot of people land in life. They go, man, I'd love to change, but where am I going to go? Who am I going to talk to? They'd rather be a part of what everyone else is doing rather than risking being alone. That's why life groups are so important. It's giving you somewhere to go. At some point, we all have to ask ourselves this question. Do I actually want the status quo? I mean, at some point, we have to look around and go, look at the results of what the status quo is. Is that what I actually want? I have a group of single friends that I love dearly, and they're trying to figure out dating in the 21st century, and it's a lot different than dating when me and my wife, well, me and my wife are still dating, but you get what I mean, like when we were on the market, so to speak, and so we're always like trying to understand and listen, and it's, they're, they're rummaging through like 30 different dating apps, which puts them on dates with 30 different people in a year, and it inevitably leaves most of them in a place of frustration. Now, they get together and they like share best practices. Okay, well, this is how you do it. This is what you put on your profile and you go back and forth. And me and my wife are just kind of like watching them go back and forth. And I'm just like, "Uh, guys, are you sure this was like, you don't know. You haven't been on the market in like 12 years. This is just how it's done now. And I'm just like, I get that. But how is how it's done now working out for you right now? Just because that's how it's done now doesn't make it effective. And sometimes we have to look around and ask ourselves if we actually want the results of the people we're seeking wisdom from the most. There's a lot of people that have a will for your life. There's whole organizations that have a will for your life. Did you know that the media has a will for your life? There is a desired emotion, an outcome that they have for your life. Billions are spent daily to bend our will to someone else's. If you're here today and you found yourself living according to someone else's will, while they might even be good people, bad plan to base your life on. The problem with our will and their will is they're just not big enough to sustain all that comes our way. The people I've seen with the most fulfillment, the people I've seen with the most joy, the people I've seen with the most peace were not the people with the most money. It was not the people with the most influence. It was not the people that had their dream job. It was the people who had centered their life around the third will. And the third will is God's will. Uh, My niece uh, recently has been applying for some pretty prestigious colleges and uh, has actually gotten accepted to to all of them. So uh, over the holidays, my family and I, we were sitting around trying to give her opinion of where she should go and why. You know, we're all kind of throwing in our, our, our reason for, for the school that she should go to. One of the schools is in Washington, D.C., and it's actually one of my favorite cities. So I start making my plea for why I think she should go to that school. Maybe I bought her sweatshirts from that school to implore her to go. My bad. Did I buy three? Maybe. That's between me, her, and Jesus. Now, here's the deal. You know, we're, we, were, we were all like trying to heavily influence her to make this decision. And at some point, I felt like we were almost putting our will on her. And it became clear to me that before she left her house, I had to encourage her with what I want to encourage you with today. What other people want for your life is not nearly as important as what God wants for your life. The best question you can be asking as it relates to your future is, Lord, Is this in your will for my life? I mean, finding our flow in all areas of our life can be complex. I know for me, I I feel like sometimes I'm constantly swinging from one side of the pendulum to the other. I feel like when things are flowing well at work, things at home can get off balance. When things at home are flowing well, it feels like things at work can get off balance. But can I tell you where I found the best flow and the best pace? is when I'm operating in the center of God's will for my life. There's no peace, my friends, like the peace 
that is found in living in the center of God's will for your life. I love what Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. He wrote, he wrote this, he said, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, you may not even be a Christian watching this. You may have even come today. Maybe your friend tricks you into coming, told you that there was going to be free breakfast or something. I don't know what they did, but you're here, okay? And here's the deal. Um, regardless if you're a Christian or not, I want you to know God prepared a good work for you long before you were born. You might have disdain for church people. You may have been hurt by church people. I get that, but you should never let that Keep you from discovering the good work God prepared for you long before you were born. Now, for a lot of us, we'd all agree that living in the center of God's will for our life is something we'd like to sign up for. But sometimes it feels mysterious or complicated. And, and here, my hope and prayer for today is this, is that we just simply take one more step towards God's plan for our life. I know so many people who spend decades of their life wandering. So today, I want to give you four questions that are going to help us discover God's will for our lives. The first question is simply this. What direction has God been pointing us in? What direction? Where is God pointing us to? I love what Galatians 5 verse 16 says. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. I want to talk to you about that word walk. I want to talk to you about what that word meant in, in the Greek language. The word walk in the Greek was the word peripateo. It appears in the New Testament about 95 times and has a very, very clear meaning. Uh, the word peripateo is a compound of the words peri and pateo, not potato, Pateo, okay? The word peri means around and suggests the idea of something that is encircling. It's this idea that a person would get so familiar with encircling an area, they knew it like the back of their hand. Kind of like that song that you've got memorized because you've listened to it so many times, you don't even need it to come on the radio, you just know it. Um, it, it, like, it it's, it's like not needing maps to get you there. You, you don't need anything. You're so familiar with going over and over and over with it that it's absolutely changed in your life. So when Paul is encouraging us to walk in the spirit, it's an invitation to become so familiar with God's promptings and direction. It's like second nature to you. That, that, that's, what, that's what we're inviting you to do in terms of walking in the spirit. Um, it actually could be translated live in the spirit. We're talking about a whole life. We're talking about your daily activity. We're talking about the sphere that encircles your very existence. We're talking about how you do everything. One scholar actually denoted it, that it was somebody that could do this so habitually that he could actually walk in the spirit blindfolded. In other words, I don't even, I don't even need to know. I, I could do it blindfolded. That's how comfortable I am. Most of us just don't spend that much time with the Holy Spirit. I want to encourage somebody today to begin living in the Spirit, almost to where it's like muscle memory for you, where it's, where it's created such a habit in your life, and this is just now the way that you function. Sometimes I think we think that God's will is like a specific job, or even being with a specific person, or that once we've made a decision on that job or that person, it's a done deal. But here's the deal. We have to walk in the spirit every day. We have to walk in God's will every single day. Like that person that you're with, it might be God's will for your life to be with them, but guess what? You're gonna have to make that decision again the next day to continue to walk in God's will. Now, when I wake up in the morning, I simply try to put my mind and spirit in a place where I'm simply paying attention to God's promptings. Most of us have gotten in trouble because we ignored one of God's promptings. We just said, ah, God, this ain't that big of a deal. Uh, let's just watch the first five minutes. Uh, we'll just eat one more. I mean, like we just ignored something that we felt a nudge, we felt a direction that we should go in, but we just said, nah. But this is part of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives, is helping us often discern the direction we're supposed 
to take. Um, I had to call uh, American Airlines the other day uh, to get a flight change, and uh, there was a young man named Marcus who was the customer service representative. Uh, he was from North Carolina, and all I could tell you is I just felt prompted to speak into his life. I just felt prompted. Now, here's the deal. Sometimes I know we get nervous about talking about Jesus to a complete stranger, but, but I thought, I'm never going to meet this guy. If this goes south, well, he'll just hang up or just go on to the next phone call. Like, like you, should just, you should just go for it. So I said, hey, man, uh, what's your first and last name? He goes, uh, he got nervous, right? He thought, like, I'm going to get him in trouble. And he goes, man, I, can't, I can only give you my first name. He goes, well, all right, dude, I'll just give you my full name. I said, hey, bro, here's the deal. I'm on the American Airlines website right now, and I'm putting in a compliment to your superiors. Because your customer service tonight has just been excellent. I want to tell you another thing. I think you have an anointing, which isn't a great word to use with a complete stranger. They're like, anointing? I go, man, let me explain to you what anointing is. I think anointing is simply means you have a touch of heaven on your life. And God has a significant plan for your life. He goes, I think you got an anointing. I said, no, 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 no. You, my friend, have a touch of heaven on your life. Why did I do that? I just felt prompted to do so. Would I say God told me to talk to Marcus? No, maybe. But again, I'm just, I'm just being, I'm just walking in the spirit. It wasn't like I woke up in the morning and said, Lord, you have a word for Marcus. Okay, thus say the Lord. Okay, I can't wait to talk to Marcus from American Airlines. That's not it. But when in the moment, again, when you have walked in the spirit long enough, you will feel his his promptings. Here's the deal. I don't want to find myself so consumed with the ideals and opinions of culture around me that I stop paying attention to what God has called me to be and who God has called me to be. It's not always about arriving at a destination, but it's about being on a journey with God. I've learned that when we give God our undivided attention, he will always respond with his direction. I wonder how many people are here today. You're going, ah, I just need to know what to do next. Here's what I'd encourage you to do. Begin to walk in the Spirit and trust the Holy Spirit's promptings. For us to be able to do that, we have to move to question number two, which is this. How much space have we given the Holy Spirit to work? How much space have we given? I mean, again, sometimes our will is so full. It, it, it's so, there's, there's just no room for the Holy Spirit to do his work. I love what Paul said to the church in Rome. Here's what he said. He said, stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. And then he says this, he says, this will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. Can I... Can I pastor you for a moment? Before you react to a headline, before you react to a tweet, before you react to a post, ask yourself, who has been the most responsible for your line of thinking thus far? B beware of adopting rhetoric that does not line up with God's will for your life. In 2020, the language we were given for the year was what? It's bad. It's horrible. It's awful. Doom. And gloom. So much so that if you were to say anything positive about 2020, you'd be deemed insensitive. Pardon me, but Twitter doesn't dictate my rhetoric or my beliefs. Neither does a political party. None of those people dictate my life, my beliefs, because my thoughts are surrendered to the Holy Spirit. I was born for such a time as this. You know what scripture says? It says the sons of Issachar understood the times and knew what to do. That's the type of thinking I want to align my life with. I've been reading uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s book, um, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? And he, he writes, he was reminded that disappointment produces despair. And despair produces bitterness. And that the one thing certain about bitterness is its blindness. Bitterness has not the capacity to make the distinction between some and all. Some of us have been so hurt by some that we've subscribed to all thinking. All politicians aren't corrupt. Some not all. All Christians aren't hypocrites. Some. 
Not all. All police aren't abusing their power. Some. Not all. All men are chauvinistic. Some. Not all. All white people are not racist. Some. Not all. I get asked all the time about how all black people feel about something that happens in the news. And my perspective as a black man may represent some black people, but still not all. All. There is grave danger in all type of thinking because we run the risk of placing a really good person in a really bad category. And they don't belong there. We can't make all pay for the mistakes of some. But I believe we should hold some accountable for the mistakes they've made it. It's kind of funny. We all hate being put in an all category that doesn't accurately portray who we really are. So shouldn't we pause before doing the same to others? At some point, we have to ask ourselves, who's in charge of our mindset and our perspective? It doesn't line up with the will of God for our life. Have we made enough space for God's Holy Spirit to do his work and maybe, maybe even change how we see a person or even a group of people? The third question that I think is important for us to discover God's will for our life is asking this question. What gifts has God given us? Every single person watching this message right now has a God-given gift. And scripture gives us some insight as to what they could possibly be. I love what it says in Romans. It says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Here's the deal. You might feel like you're not the most talented person in the world. You might be watching this right now. Oh, dude, I, I, I'm not that gifted. Did you see the list? Two of them. I guarantee you could do it a day. Number one, you can encourage somebody. Go ahead. Try it. Yeah. As soon as service is over, see if you got that gift. Some people really don't got that gift. They can't give a, compliments hurt their teeth when they give it. Okay. Like they just don't, they're just not good at it. Okay. But you can practice today. Okay. The, another gift that is in there is serving. Guess what? Every single one of us can do that. You want to operate in your gift. We also see an example of this in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 31. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, see, I have chosen Bezalel, what a name, son of Uri, the son of Ur of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge and with all kinds of skills to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood and to engage in all kinds of craft. I mean, Here's another example of the spirit of God filling a person's life. And, and, and wow, look what's coming out. Look what the Holy Spirit is producing in their life. Do you know what your God given gift is? What's the thing that maybe comes natural for you that others have to work hard for? I mean, knowing what your gift is, is first. Knowing what to do with your gift is second. I love what first Peter says. It says each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If you've been given a gift by God, it's something you were given to steward well for the benefit of other people. I wonder how many people under the sound of my voice are watching or listening to this message. You've got gifts on the inside of you, man, that are sleeping. I want you to find your flow. <laughs> I want you to wake up that gift on the inside of you that's been sleeping for way too long. I want you to live every day of your life operating in the gift God gave you. The fourth question that I believe can help us discover God's will for our life is, is asking this question. Is this destiny or distraction? Is this destiny or distraction? One of my main concerns for where we are as a culture right now is the amount of distractions we all deal with. Oh, we've got so many distractions. And I find 
that there are a lot of people who can't figure out their purpose and have no idea what God's will is for their life because they're simply distracted with platforms, apps, and entertainment that quite honestly just isn't helping them move towards God's will for their life. When I look at the many people I know who used to be Christians, I think to myself, what happened? What happened? Man, for some of them, they simply just got distracted. Got distracted by a career. A lot of them got distracted by a relationship. When trying to discern God's will for your life, you have to begin asking God, Lord, is this destiny or distraction? There's an often untold story of a man in the New Testament that is only mentioned in three verses. While only mentioned three times, we can feel the impact and lessons from his life in just three verses. The first one is found in Colossians. The Apostle Paul writes, Luke, the beloved doctor sends his greetings, and so does the mosque. So this man who's rolling with Luke, the author of one of the four main gospels that tell the story of Jesus Christ and the apostle Paul says, hey, hey guys, Luke, Luke says, what's up? We know Luke, everybody knows Luke. And Paul says, oh, and so does the mob. He does something similar in, in a letter to Philemon. Here's the second verse. It says, Epiphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings. So do Mark, Aristarchus, Damas, and Luke, my co-workers, again, the, the, the mosque got street cred, okay? He is rolling with the goats. He's important. Scholars believe the mosque was some sort of important elder or had some sort of significant amount of influence in the first century church. But it's his third mention that tells us something that I believe should serve as a warning to us. Second Timothy, verse, chapter four, verse nine, it says, Timothy, please come as soon as you can. Damas has deserted me because he loves the things of this life and has gone to Thessalonica. Cretans has gone to Galatia and Titus has gone to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Bring Mark with you when you come for he will be helpful to me, my ministry. I don't know what Damas's vice was. I don't know what was so great in Thessalonica, but whatever it was, it made Damas believe it was worth abandoning his ministry and his friend. I wish it was because Damas was exhausted from missionary work. I wish Damas had, had deserted Paul because he was afraid of persecution. I wish he was a coward. But that wasn't his issue from what we gather from just three verses. The thing the Apostle Paul points out is the mere fact that the moth had an infatuation with the things of this life that had such a stronghold on his life that he found himself drifting away from God's will for his life. Is there a relationship in your life right now that you thought was a part of your destiny? But it's really a distraction. Is there anything in your life you're no longer holding? Because in all reality, it's got a hold of you. Is there a career that's bringing in some decent income? But if you're honest, it's costing you your marriage, your friendships. Maybe your kids barely speak to you. I mean, I got to ask you, destiny? Or is it a distraction? I'm gonna give each and every person under the sound of my voice at one of the many City First locations or if, if you're watching online, I wanna to, to give you an opportunity to surrender your life to Jesus. To really find a rhythm in your life, to find a flow, to give your soul an anchor. Maybe for you, you've walked away from church, you've walked away from faith, you've walked away from God. Maybe today you want to rededicate your life to Christ, or maybe you were invited by a friend. You say, you know what, today's, today's my day. I want, I want to start in a brand new direction. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to give each and every person an opportunity. 
If that's you today, you say, hey, Ryan, yeah, man, I, I would love to surrender my life to Christ, maybe for the first time or the second time. If that's you, at every location, would you just slip up your hand and say, hey, Ryan, that's me. Hey, Ryan, that's me. I'm sure there are hands all, all over at, at our many locations. Hey, can we all just repeat this prayer together as one big family? Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on a cross for my sins. I ask now that you would be the Lord and Savior of my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, can we make some noise for every single person that gave their heart to Christ?